Good day, everyone. On behalf of the Office of Public and Indian Housing, PIH, and the Office of Community Planning and Development, CPD, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. Our webinar is called Ending Homelessness Through the Housing Choice Voucher and Public Housing Programs. My name is Danielle Basterash, and I will be the moderator. We are lucky to have national experts presenting today. Ryan Jones from the Office of Public Housing and Amaris Rodriguez from the Office of Housing Voucher Programs. Today we will be discussing PIH Notice 2013-15 entitled Guidance on Housing Individuals and Families Experiencing Homelessness Through the Public Housing and Housing Choice Voucher Programs. This notice is extremely important as it not only contains mandatory reporting requirements for PHAs, but also provides helpful guidance on ways to house homeless families in your community. President Obama has said that no one should be without a safe place to call home. In support of that statement, Secretary Donovan recently sent a letter out to all PHAs emphasizing the importance of housing homeless families and requesting assistance in reaching the goal of ending chronic homelessness by 2015 and ending family homelessness by 2020 a reality. These goals and the pathways for accomplishing these goals are laid out in Opening Doors, the Federal Strategic Plan to End Homelessness. We cannot do this alone and hopefully this webinar will provide valuable information that can assist your community in eradicating all forms of homelessness. To give you some context as to the extent of homelessness in the United States, on a single night in January 2012, there were 633,782 homeless persons. Of them, roughly 400,000 individuals, 77,000 families, 63,000 veterans and 100,000 chronically homeless persons spent the night without a home. PHAs and Continuums of Care, COCs, are already doing some great work preventing and ending homelessness, and we will use examples of their best practices throughout the webinar. However, please be reminded that this webinar is an overview of the PIH Notice 2013-15, and for more detailed information and notice requirements, you should refer to the notice itself. The PIH Notice focuses on five major areas. Accurately and consistently reporting to HUD homeless status at admissions, partnering with community organizations such as homeless service providers and COCs, managing the waiting list to provide homeless populations increased access to PHA's programs, reviewing discretionary admissions and termination or eviction policies to determine if any changes can be made to remove barriers for serving the population, and finally, using project-based vouchers to create permanent supportive housing. I'm now going to ask Amaris and Ryan to help walk through the notice. Ryan. Can you talk a little bit about what the requirements are for reporting the homeless status at admission in IMS or PIC and why it is important? All right, thank you, Daniel. PHAs are required to report certain family characteristics for the households they serve on the form HUD 50058. The data collected on the form provides HUD with a picture of the people who participate in the subsidized program. This information is submitted electronically allowing HUD to analyze the subsidized housing program, monitor PHAs, provide information to Congress, and in the case of line C 4C, track our progress towards ending homelessness when used with other tools. Line 4C of the form requires that PHAs report as to whether a family was homeless at admission. PHAs must determine whether an individual or family was homeless at admission. Additional information on this topic is covered in Section 4 of the notice. Thank you, Ryan. And through discussions with PHAs and HUD reviewing the IMS PIC data, um, we have noticed that not all PHAs are reporting on the Line 4C homeless field accurately. Uh, so what can PHAs do if the reporting software to edit the 50058 is automatically reporting no or not prompting a response for whether a family was homeless at admission to the program? The PHA should contact its software vendor to get the problem corrected. Okay. So we know PHAs must report on this field, but how should they define homelessness for reporting purposes? 
HUD defines homelessness for reporting purposes in two categories. An individual or family who lacks a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, and certain individuals fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking. Section 5 of the notice goes into greater detail and provides some examples that may help PHA intake coordinators or community partners assisting with the referral process. Are PHAs required to collect documentation or third-party verification of any kind in order to verify an applicant's homelessness status for reporting on line 4C of the 50058? No. Verbal self-certification is sufficient. However, in order to verify the homeless status of an applicant for a waiting list preference, PHAs must follow the verification requirements established in their written policy, which is covered later in the webinar. Do PHAs that have a different definition for homeless in their administrative plan or admissions and continued occupancy policy, ACOP, have to change their definition as a result of this clarification for a 50058 reporting? No. PHAs can adopt or maintain a definition of homeless for the purpose of a preference that differs from the definition used for reporting purposes. If a PHA uses a different definition for a homeless preference, they should ensure that their PHA policies reflect that difference and ensure that their intake coordinators are aware of the difference between the definition of homeless for reporting purposes and that for applying a waiting list preference. The definition used for homeless preference should reflect local community priorities and will likely mirror the definition used by the community partners. Section 5 of the notice goes into greater detail and provides some examples that may help PHA intake coordinators or community partners assisting with the referral process. I think inherent in the notice uh, is an emphasis, uh, and it talks about how important community partners are to the PHA efforts to serve individuals and families experiencing homelessness. That's right. Given the economic and budgetary environment for PHAs, the importance of community partners has never been more important and is a critical tool in addressing homelessness. Housing commitments can often generate investments of funding for supportive services, as well as leverage local and state capital resources for new development. There are many federal government programs dedicated to providing primary and behavioral health care and other services to low-income households, some of which are targeted specifically to individuals experiencing homelessness, while others are geared towards low-income families more broadly. Increasingly, we're also seeing the important roles of philanthropic communities. For the purposes of this webinar and the notice, we focus on local community partners like the Continuum of Care, or COC. The communities that have been most successful in working towards ending homelessness are the ones where the PHA is working directly with homeless service providers, the local Continuum of Care, local VA officials, and others. And in what ways have you found community partners able to assist PHA efforts? Helping PHAs realize the extent of the challenge, the continuum of care, and other community members already have a wealth of information on the homeless population in the community, whether it's through the point in time or through their day-to-day -day interaction with these families. Community partners can help PHAs analyze data and develop targets and recognition of housing resources and supportive services available in the community. Can you Community partners can also help a PHA reduce barriers to program admission by helping PHAs identify where policies are too restrictive. Amars will be speaking to admissions policies regarding criminal activity, substance abuse, use, and rental history later in this webinar. As a reminder, discretionary policies must be applied broadly to comply with fair housing requirements. Other opportunities or reasons for partnership, pre-screening and referring homeless families and individuals. The COC program interim rule requires continuums of care to establish and operate a centralized or coordinated assessment system that provides an initial comprehensive assessment of the needs of the individual and families for housing and services with the intention of matching the homeless individual or family with the most appropriate resources. As mentioned in 7C 
of the notice, Section 7C that is, PHAs are strongly encouraged to participate in the coordinated assessment system that covers the PHA's geographic location in order to establish a means for referral once the coordinated assessment has been established. It may also help families collect necessary verification. Section 7F of the notice reminds PHAs that they may allow a partnering organization to verify the individual's or family's preferences qualification before the individual or family is referred to the PHA. Community partners are also a great use resource providing housing search and support varying from transportation to establishing a relationship with the property manager. They're also great for facilitating the move-in process. And even after moving into a new home, community partners may help ensure housing stability include including compliance with program and family obligations and other program requirements. As an example, the Houston Housing Authority has created a new position that focuses on homeless and housing initiatives. Functions of the program manager for homeless and housing initiatives include creating and maintaining relationships with its philanthropic and faith-based communities actively engaging in community homeless outreach efforts, and participating in the planning of community-wide centralized intake among others. The Houston Housing Authority and its partners have established a retention committee that utilizes existing empirical research, literature, and qualitative data to identify key factors that lead to homelessness, citizenism, and identifies service gaps, resource gaps, related to key factors of homeless recidivism, among others. Thanks, Ryan. So let's say a PHA has worked with community partners to identify community need, and in cooperation with the community partners, has reduced the barriers in the application process. In thinking through the PHA policies, what would be the next step? Well, first I would say it sounds like the PHA is on their way to making real contributions to ending homelessness in the, its community. The PHA waiting list can be a major barrier to individuals and families experiencing homelessness having access to the public housing and housing choice voucher program. The greatest tool for increasing program access for individuals and families experiencing homelessness is establishing a preference in their admissions policy. Section 6 and seven of the notice discuss waiting list management within the context of persons experiencing homelessness. We're going to briefly cover some of those concepts today. So how should a PHA go about reviewing its admissions preferences? The first step in establishing admissions preferences includes assessing the local housing needs and priorities. This is a great opportunity to work collaboratively with healthcare providers, homeless and other social service providers, continuums of care, local office of government, and other community organizations to establish a system of preferences based on local needs. PHAs with established waiting list preferences should already be familiar with the requirements to base preferences on local housing needs. But they may not all be aware of the availability of special data sources. The point in time count, community plan to end homelessness, and the consolidated plan are great sources of information. The consolidated plan should also help the PHA develop a strategy that balances the needs of the entire low-income population in the community. As an example, the City of Philadelphia's consolidated plan includes an action plan to prevent homelessness that includes, among other things, a homeless needs assessment. This action plan was developed in coordination with their continuum of care. We'll be using the Philadelphia Housing Authority as an example in an upcoming webinar on move-up strategies. PHAs will want to consider the need, needs of the families they plan to house, the housing resources available, and what is the most appropriate housing intervention based on the needs and resources. This strategy will look different for every community and family. P 
PHAs will want to consider the need of families they plan to house, the housing resources available, and what is the most appropriate housing intervention based on those needs, as I mentioned before. The PHA could add homelessness as part of its ranking system, whereby applicants that qualify for the highest preference are assisted first. For example, a preference in the PHA's public housing program that one out of every four public housing admissions will go to an individual or family experiencing homelessness, or a preference in the PHA's voucher program where every tenth voucher that becomes available upon turnover goes to a homeless family for up to a set number of vouchers in a month or a year. We've had a few PHAs ask if a waiver is required from HUD to establish waiting list preferences or a limited preference. The answer is no. PHAs already have this flexibility. As a reminder, preferences must be included in the PHA's policy documents, such as the PHA plan, if applicable, and the HCV administrative plan for the voucher program and the ACOP for the public housing program. All recipients of public housing or HCV assistance must be selected from the PHA's waiting list. A PHA that intends to establish a preference should follow its written policies on how they plan to inform the public and families currently on the public housing and HCV waiting list. Section 7C of the notice goes into greater detail on the notification process, while Section 7D discusses the identifying preferences qualified applicants currently on the waiting list. This includes a recommendation that PHAs develop formal or informal policies reaching out to agencies that work closely with people experiencing homelessness. As a reminder, the notification process must comply with fair housing requirements. PHAs may create a preference or limited preference specifically for people who are referred by a partnering excuse me, a partnering homeless service organization or consortia or organization. For example, an organization that refers families moving out of transitional housing, this is often referred to as a move up strategy. PHAs should keep in mind that they may not limit the source of referral to an agency, organization, or consortia that denies its services to members of any federally protected class under fair housing laws. Section 7E of the notice provides an example of a homeless limited preference process. PHAs should keep in mind that they may not limit the source of referrals to an agency, organization, or consortium that denies its services to members of any federal, federally protected class in the fair housing laws, as I mentioned before. A PHA may also have a preference for individuals and families transition or moving up from permanent supportive housing. As mentioned before, HUD will be hosting a, a webinar focusing on moving up strategies for examples of PHAs that are currently implementing this. As an example of a PHA waiting list preference, Loudoun County Virginia Housing Authority found that when a housing choice voucher is provided to a person experiencing homelessness, this provides stability and an opportunity for the person to focus on their issues and solve medical or other problems. This has an impact on reducing the person's needs for other services administered by the Department of Family Services. In this example, as housing choice voucher becomes available, every tenth voucher is made available to a person experiencing homelessness, up to ten vouchers. HUD recommends that PHAs review their written residency preferences to consider whether it is unnecessarily restrictive against families living in shelters or other places a person experiencing homelessness may be living or sleeping. PHAs may consider establishing a policy that allows them to consider circumstances leading to a family's current place of residence. For example, in some communities, there may be a lack of suitable shelters in the community covered by the PHA's residency preference, forcing the individuals or family to seek shelter in a neighboring community. 
by adopting a policy allowing for consideration of circumstances, this family may still receive the benefits of residency preference. For additional guidance on waiting list administration, see notice PIH 2012-34. Thank you, Ryan. Before we move on to other topics, there was a question that came up after publishing the notice, and it is, can a PHA require applicants to have income in order to qualify for assistance? Thank you for that question. The answer is no. There is no statutory or regulatory authority that allows PHAs to establish minimum income requirements. While PHAs are allowed to charge a minimum rent of up to $50, the PHA must grant an exemption from payment of minimum rent if the family is unable to pay it because of financial hardship. Thank you. Now we will turn our attention to admissions. Amaris, can you review the mandatory prohibitions for admission that cannot be modified by PHAs? Sure. Under federal laws and hard regulations, there are certain policies for admissions to a PHA's housing choice voucher or public housing program which are mandatory for all PHAs. Therefore, PHAs have no discretion to modify or to whether to apply or not apply this um, mandatory admissions policy. There are four mandatory prohibitions regarding criminal activity and substance abuse. Those are listed in the slide. This fourth one, which is eviction within the past three years from federally assisted housing for drug-related criminal activity, I'm going to stop here for a while because there are two exceptions to this mandatory prohibition. Basically, a PHA may admit if the evicted household member has completed a supervised drug rehabilitation program approved by the PHA. The circumstances leading to eviction no longer exist. For example, the criminal household member has died or is imprisoned. There are, cer there are certain discretionary admissions policies where PHAs do have discretion uh, to adopt those policies. PHAs are encouraged to review their discretionary admission policies to determine if any changes can be made to re remove barriers to serving people experiencing homelessness. In June 2011, Secretary Donovan wrote a letter to all PHAs to encourage more flexible, reasonable admissions policies for people re-entering communities following incarceration. These flexibilities are especially important, meaning the flexibilities in the PHA's admi discretionary admissions policy are especially important to individuals that have touched the criminal justice system related to the symptoms of an untreated mental illness or other disabling condition. When you're reviewing your discretionary admissions policies, solicit feedback from community partners during the process of reviewing and modifying your policies. Also, any change in admissions policies must be applied broadly. Section 8 of the notice goes into greater detail on this subject. So here is an example of a PHA that has modified some of, some of its admission policies which is the Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles. And they have done so in consultation with homeless service organizations in the community. By making changes to local po policies that were more restrictive than those required by federal law, the Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles has been able to significantly reduce barriers for people experiencing chronic homelessness and those who may have had contact with the criminal justice system because of behaviors related to the symptoms of mental illness and, or other disabilities. PHAs may also consider reviewing their processes for admission to determine if they present a barrier to serving people experiencing homelessness, homelessness and for others. For example, PHAs may consider giving families a time window for intake appointments to account for work schedules, access to transportation, and others. Or PHAs may also consider offering several locations and methods by which applicants may submit their applications. This is particularly advisable for PHAs in areas of high demand. What about efforts to keep families in the program? What kind of flexibility do PHAs have with regard to termination and, admission and eviction policies? 
Like the mandatory prohibitions for admissions, there are certain instances where a PHA or owner must terminate assistant, assistance or evict a family. Listed on the slide are, are examples of mandatory termination and eviction policies. Some of these cross over, meaning that they are applicable both to applicants and prog program participants. Where PHA has discretion, HUD recommends that PHAs consider reviewing termination and eviction policies in partnership with homeless service providers. There are certain instances where the PHA has discretion on this, including optional lease provisions at the discretion of the PHA in the case of public housing. It is also important for PHAs to have a clause in the written policies to allow for consideration of circumstances. PHAs must apply discretionary policies broadly and may not favor one family type over another. This slide gives you some references where you can find program termi termination and eviction policies. Thank you, Amaris. In 2012, HUD, in conjunction with the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, hosted two national convenings of PHAs and Continuum of Cares. One of the major topics of interest was project-based vouchers. Can you please walk us through what project-based vouchers are and why they may be an appropriate tool in a community for serving, ex for serving families experiencing homelessness? Sure. The Project-Based Voucher Program, or PBV, is a component of the Housing Choice Voucher Program, where a PHA may use up to 20% of their voucher budget authorities for, for specific housing units. Now, PHAs do not receive funding specifically for the program, but rather they use the funding under their tenant-based voucher program, up to 20%. Through, through PBV, PHAs are able to secure capital investments from other funders funders to make a project attainable. This is useful for new projects or rehabilitation of existing housing units. PHAs can use PVV assistance to pair housing with services. Generally, a PHA cannot use PVV assistance for more than 25% of the number of dwelling units, either assisted or unassisted, in a building. This 25% cap does not apply if units in a project are available to the elderly, families with disabilities, or families receiving supportive services. In such cases, a PHA may use PBV assistance in up to 100% of the units in the project. Owner proposals for, for PBV assistance are selected in accordance with PHA policy as described in the PHA's administrative plan. There are two methods by which PHAs must select PVV proposals. The first is a, is a competitive selection. The PHA requests PVV proposals by providing broad public notice of the opportunity to offer PVV proposals for consider, consideration by the PHA. Or PHA could select units that were selected under a similar federal, state, or local competition within three years from the PHA's selection date of the units for PVV assistance, and the earlier competition did not involve any consideration for PVV assistance as stated in the regulation at 24 CFR 983.51b. In terms of family selection, families must be selected from the PHA's waiting list for PVV assistance in accordance with the PHA's selection policies. If the owner refers a family for assistance, the family must be placed and selected from the PHA's waiting list. PHAs have flexibility to establish a waiting list for their PVV program that is separate from their tenant-based voucher program. Or PHAs may choose to establish separate waiting lists for a project or building or for a set of buildings, or may create a comprehensive waiting list for their entire PVV program. Additionally, the PHA may adopt different, pref different preferences for each separate waiting list. 
A PHA that wishes to partner with a homeless service provider to project-based vouchers may consider creating a separate waiting list for the project and adopting a preference limited to people referred by the partnering organization. As mentioned previously, PHAs that do this may not limit the source of referrals to an agency, organization, or consortia that denies its services to members of any, any federally protected class under fair housing law. PHAs may also adopt a preference for services to, fam to disabled families for services offered at a particular project. Such a preference is limited to those individuals and families with disabilities that significantly interfere with their ability to obtain and maintain the, themselves in housing, who without appropriate supportive services will not be able to obtain or maintain themselves in housing, and for whom such services cannot be provided in a non-segregated setting. And you can find the regulation pertaining to this preference at 24 CFR 983.251D. So here is an example of a PHA who's using project-based vouchers to serve homeless families and individuals. The Houston Housing Authority will be adding units of permanent, permanent housing for the homeless by using PVV at new, rehabilitated, or existing developments that provide supportive services and comply with program requirements and federal housing quality standards. Developers who are serving those experiencing chronic homelessness were awarded additional points under the housing, Houston Housing Authority scoring system for PVV proposal. PVV regulations can be found at 24 CFR, that's Code of Federal Regulations, Part 983. HUD Notice PIH 2011-54 also provides guidance to PHAs relating to the project-based voucher program. Thank you, Amaris and Ryan. This concludes our webinar for today. While the goals of opening doors are ambitious, we do believe that working together we can eliminate homelessness. We thank you for your time and attention. If you have questions, concerns, or comments, please email us at openingdoors at hud.gov. Thank you. <laughs>